And for me, the, the, the relevance of yoga as well is that these experiences are very exalted. Yeah, and, and I have had a lot of contradiction o- over the years, practicing meditation, really emphasizing a lack of content or just pure consciousness. I kind of judged my intellectual pursuit, but then for me, that that process of research and revelation is is a oneness experience. It's a a, a window into that holistic nature of, of the universe through knowledge. Welcome to Connecting with Coincidence. I'm your host, Bernie Beitman. I'm a psychiatrist, uh, and I study meaningful coincidences. I, I like doing it. It's it's fun to see how they work. And today, our, our guest is going to tell us a f- fairly long story, but it's of a certain kind of category. A lot of coincidences are like our synchronicities. I think of something, and it happens out there in some form or, or another. Well, how about if you have a bunch of those? in a row over time so that I think of it as like uh, swinging from vine to vine in the coincidence jungle or playing on a, in a playground on the monkey bars. Uh, It's just going from one thing to the next and they're all a string and they kind of fit together. So let's see, let's see what Ricky Deriz tells us uh, after I tell you a little bit about him. He's in Berlin. Uh, I'm going to go visit Berlin, and we'll meet together uh, sometime soon. Uh, and Ricky Deriz is a writer, speaker, and host of Mind the Mind That Ego podcast. Inspired by his battle with mental illness and subsequent awakening, Ricky's independent research and self-inquiry practice synthesizes depth psychology, spirituality, philosophy, science, and more. To support a cohesive model of reality, to support a cohesive model of reality that allows for a life enriching relationship with the cosmos, one of enchantment, mystery, and mysticism. Gotta like that. Mm -hmm. Ricky, welcome, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for inviting me on, and I appreciate the introduction as well. You're very welcome. And we're going to be talking about yoga and synchronicity after a while, but uh, let's start with uh, your Alan Watts, the beginning with Alan Watts book. Yeah. So as you say, it is, it is a sequential story and an unfolding and it is quite lengthy, but I think it talks to the nature of synchronicity, at least in this, in this format in this kind of manifestation and honoring what you mentioned in the intro as well, the different kind of pathways of my journey, the way I view and try and and retell these experiences brings in lots of different dimensions. One of them being intuition or instinct and the very first, let's say domino in this kind of chain we were just waking up one morning and I, I had Alan Watts, uh, The Wisdom of Insecurity. I'd bought the book a few months before and I was traveling back to Bristol in the UK. And the moment that I woke up that morning, I just had in mind, I'm going to take that book with me. That's the book that I'm going to take. It's just, you know, the decisions made. For whatever reason, I woke up with that that idea in mind. You can see in the background, I know I tried showing you earlier and it's not so clear, but on my bookshelf, there are three uh, Buddha ornaments and the wisdom of insecurity was on the top shelf. And as I reached out, and this is maybe an hour or two before I'm set to leave, I reach up to the shelf, knock one of the ornaments off. And as it falls, the head just completely snaps off. <laughs> and I'm, I'm with my partner and we just pause and I look at her and I'm like, that must be a bad omen. Like this is, just, you know, I'm just about to travel just reach for this book and you now this for, ornament. You reach for the book and it was reach, yeah. You reached for it. And then how did it happen? The next step. 
in terms and, of not the, the with the ornament yeah just purely reaching up and as i go to pull the book back it just falls off the shelf and um, it was a, it was a it was a buddha statue one of three yeah you know you can get the collection where they have different hand gestures and some of them are doing this and different mudras um yeah and it, and it fell and it was just a complete clean break the head was was off <laughs> off with his head off said the queen head. and alice in wonderland yeah. off yeah. with his head so <laughs> alice the queen got <laughs> because he was he was wrecking time in alice in wonderland that's a nice link as well actually i didn't because that that kind of relates in terms of the rabbit hole of synchronicity it is a nice link go ahead good 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 yeah so so this that was step one uh, and it was this kind of initial shock and then the smile and the laughter of almost you could say the the double meaning of these experiences where initially it could be okay that's a that's could be taken literally or it could be taken symbolically and there was kind of gallows humor in that um i didn't think too much of it other than that being quite jarring and i know synchronicities often have that way of just jolting you awake or, or kind of shifting your your perception in some way i didn't think too much of it took the book and as i started reading the book on on the plane within the first few pages in the introduction there was um it was it was written by deepak chopra and i'm going to paraphrase a few of these quotes because obviously I, I can't remember them exactly but just in the the preface Deepak Chopra says Alan Watts that like he's talking of, of Buddhism and spirituality and various approaches and actually says that Alan Watts approach is more inclined to smash idols and it was seeing that that phrase and the kind of emotional resonance in seeing that that phrase of smashing idols that was like oh okay, there's, there's something else to this. Um, and within that book, it possibly still on, on the same flight, there was more mention um, of the headless way, which is like a, a Zen practice and a theme that was emerging. But even uh, in a taxi on the way to the airport, there was a song that mentioned, I lose my head over you. Like it was really bizarre. There were, there were lots of different um, moments to do that were reflecting this this idea of losing your head um, or headlessness in, in some way. So here you were, uh, the headless horseman, r riding through <laughs> <laughs> your journey, uh, thinking about <laughs> no head. Um, and you had at least four instances, smash, smash the Idols, Alan Watts, um, um, and... Uh, a couple of other a couple of other references uh, at being a headless person meaning not being so concentrated on thought um and being more in your heart as a kind mm -hmm. of metaphor for doing that so how, what did these uh, i'm going to keep asking you what did these mean to you um at, can, at any time you want to but you may want to continue talking about the mm -hmm. other ones or even up to this point, there are four different ones that I've just heard. So for our audience, it's trying to keep in mind um, what your experience ongoing might have been. Yeah, it's a good question. And I think for context, this happened. It wasn't the first time that I had these synchronicities where they seem to begin to emerge and then almost encourage me to inquire further. It happened with a few other symbols and it becomes something that I was exploring. So there was that element of intrigue and I used, you know, the word enchantment in, in my bio as well. This feeling of there's something here operating and, and something I'm engaging or participating with and there appears to be more to it. So it's very much a feeling of handling or navigating these different meanings the one being the, the headlessness literally which felt like a bad omen but then almost this trickster feel or, or this joker feel to there's something unfolding it seems relevant to alan watts and i think of his energy he calls himself like a, a 
philosophical entertainer or, or something like that uh, back in the day. So there was a feeling of intrigue, of illumination, just a general sense of, I, I had a, a sense there was more to it and that there was a pathway. I like this idea of the headless horseman. It felt like I was, there was something more to follow because as well, for me at that point, the personal meaning is that I was playing with knowledge and research and how synchronicity relates to that. So there was already a sense of when this happens, I'm, I'm going to inquire further into it. Um, like I was being asked to in some sense by another form of intelligence or, or something outside of my conscious mind. You mentioned that you've had sequential synchronicities like this before. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's important for me, for our audience, as I study meaningful coincidences, that people tend to have certain kinds of synchronicity experiences. There's a whole range of them. And I get intrigued by the repeated pattern mm -hmm. that you are demonstrating, uh, but the, 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 the kind of thing. So we can leave that for later, but that's, uh, an to me, an important way of understanding synchronicity personally. So please, co please continue. Yeah, and that, because for, for, there's the two domains i guess there's the sequential aspect of things unfolding and then there's the apparition or growing clarity around what the meaning is that tends to be like how, how i've experienced it there's a big question mark and then through the the increase in incidents it becomes clearer or more confused in short term <laughs> that also happens um so with this, I, I actually, and, and I've done it before, I then kind of take over the, the research and, and I started to look when I was in Bristol. And I would just, I mean, I just searched online, Alan Watts, headless, headless Buddha symbolism, um, was looking into in certain areas in like India, possibly, you know, these statues were, were beheaded and sold, but then the idea of the headless Buddha had certain connotations. I found also, uh, I mentioned the headless way. I found, uh, you know, various content around that, but it kind of lacked a bit of emotional resonance. Like I didn't, I didn't feel satisfied with what I was finding in, in that conscious exploration, almost like I was being led down that pathway and it was a dead end. Like it, it was almost like reflecting my own relationship to synchronicity and then turning it on its head in some <laughs> in some strange way so the the lack of that continued and I just kind of left it I, I felt rather than these things happening almost by themselves I felt like there was a part of me that was then trying to look for further meaning and that didn't really lead me anywhere and it was only a while later I found a talk by Alan Watts, which was called Swimming Headless. And it was in that talk that I would say three or four various themes that I'd been exploring all came together in that talk. And it was it was quite overwhelming to see the the overlap of those um those themes. You've just said you've just said something um that I continue to find intriguing. You had a question. Mm -hmm. What does this mean? Mm -hmm. And it's the asking the question is so important, much more than I even realized before. Part of being a therapist is asking good questions uh, and listening after <laughs> you ask. <laughs> it's a good idea to listen. <laughs> I'm working with uh, Chat GPT, and the crucial thing in working with uh, AI is to ask the right questions and you have to be clear about it. And there's something in between here, being a therapist mm -hmm. asking questions and chat GPT. And you, you, like a lot of people, asking a question about some spiritual question, uh, problem, conundrum, puzzle. And 
you become alert to the possibility mm -hmm. of a, of a response like putting something in the chat gpt is like you're looking for a response you get it really fast in in our analog reality as opposed to digital it takes somewhat longer but you yeah. were looking what do you think about the idea that you were asking and then you've got a response mm -hmm. so at this point i think it's good for me to because you mentioned therapy and that therapeutic relationship and i think it's useful to me for me to make the distinction between previously that there's been an overlap in my experience of synchronicity between knowledge in a, a some sense of maybe theoretical maybe relevant knowledge that i can apply to myself and my life through i don't know jungian psychology philosophy whatever that may be and then personal meaning and from quite early on with with this um particular synchronicity i had a sense it was more to do with knowledge um in the realm of this is something i can write i i'd written oh this actually i forgot to mention there's so much to it i'm going to forget parts of it but a few weeks before this all happened i wrote a series on um my website about the spiritual ego and in the article on spiritual narcissism mention the quote if you see the buddha on the way kill him which is from this you know an ancient quote um and it basically talks to this this theme of iconoclasm so I had that sense this is more knowledge based it's going to include me as well and there's stuff that i can take from it personally but the process of, of knowledge was where that question was being asked and i did have that sense because you mentioned time the the play of this unfolding felt like there was something pre-existing like a body of work or a collection of, of ideas through alan watts in, in particular that was then revealing itself through these synchronicities and that's where i make the distinction because you have like that body of work existing in the non-local field somewhere i i would <laughs> imply but then it had a degree of personal meaning but it was more about the exploration of knowledge and synchronicities relationship to it if that makes sense whereas yeah, previously yeah. yeah i there's there's a synchronicity as a, a, a psychotherapy or psychotherapy through synchronicity that yeah it happens as you're talking about it can have personal relevance but for you it was finding out knowledge that is in what what you'll call the non-local field what i call the psychosphere uh, mm -hmm. the, the a place where there is stuff we can reach for if we reach for it if we're looking for it so this is not you were okay so that that's i'll stop there yeah so so it felt you know interesting you say about this process of asking the question i and i'm just going to talk freely about how i experienced Please this with, without Please. <laughs> I, I felt like i was caught in a um a bit of a trick or a bit of a game in terms of okay, I'm trying to play the, the game of synchronicity and I'm being led down these false pathways and the desire to know, my my ego's desire to know or to, to find out was then, you know, becoming like a dog chasing its tail. Like I, I was almost like the more I was trying to find that answer based on my previous experiences, the more elusive, elusive it became. So it had this meta level to it but like the more I reached for it, it, it went out of my my grasp. And that's very Alan Watts-esque. Like I can imagine <laughs> Alan Watts looking down and laughing at the situation. It had that that sense to it. And it was really when I got to a point where I'd let go of that, that there was there was further meaning uh, that came up. But for sure, the, the, the relationship, so something that was mentioned in that talk, and there's a lot to this as well in terms of, remembering quotes and stuff like that but he does mention in swimming headless and i recommend anyone to go listen to this talk it's, it's brilliant he talks about knowledge 
in that. And he mentions knowledge in a traditional sense, like how we you know, have knowledge here, the perceiver, you learn by ingesting information. He uses the metaphor of knowledge being much more like a, a flower and the stem and the knower and known are basically an extension of the same. And that for me was like, oh wow, that, that talks to, to knowledge and synchronicity in the sense that on some level, the knower and known exist in the same space, but the revelation to the conscious mind is part of the, the process of synchronicity. If that, if that makes sense. Yeah, it, 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 the, the stem and the flower, the stem is the source the stem is the source and the flower is what we can see and admire mm -hmm. but the petals are each part of the other the known mm -hmm. and the knowing the the, the 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 whatever is true is also what is true of the other side of it they're all part of the same entity that's mm -hmm. a beautiful metaphor R ricky yeah, I mean, I thank Alan Watts for that for and for being directed <laughs> towards that. And it, and it does link, you know, nicely to the idea of yoga and union and and that pathway through how knowledge, at least in, in my understanding, knowledge can lead to that sense of union because as you describe, the stem, the flower, the petals themselves are all one in the same. And I've always found that like creativity and research has that transcendent feel to it. So it, all of that coalesce really nicely to, to a theme of, um, you know, knowledge and, and mysticism and awakening and um, the role that synchronicity has in that. And what role, what role does synchronicity have in that, Ricky? <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, as, as I'm talking to this experience, I, I, I know there are different pathways in yoga and yoga just to mean traditionally union with God or union with the divine. So like a mystical experience and the Jnanic path or Jnanic path is the path of knowledge. It's also known as the razor's edge. And there's a reason for that is using the intellect to transcend itself. And it's said to be the hardest path to get right because you can just end up as I was stuck in these loops <laughs> and kind of going down these, these, you know, rows with dead ends, using the intellect and using knowledge to transcend the intellect is, is risky or it can just keep you stuck in, in various ways. So part of the, the essay for, for the pay for universe and the exploration with that was looking at if you can create a sense or if you can cultivate a sense of union with God, with the, the cosmos, however you want to describe it, through knowledge, it stands to reason that synchronicity is a bridge between the knowledge and the perceiver of that that allows for an experience of oneness, exactly, you know, to, to experience the stem and the flower, not, not just to experience what it's like to learn but to have almost a trance-like state and experience of learning or revealing um i also mention it in the paper the etymology of meaning i'm not sure exactly how to pronounce this let's just say meningi not sure if that's the right pronunciation but it means the act of remembering and all the spiritual traditions in terms of the self, you know, they inquire like to, to remember who we truly are. So for me, there's almost like a transfer of knowledge that feels like remembering, or it feels like the higher self is, is reflecting it to you. And synchronicity being part of that transference, that revelation. Uh, could you could you talk a little bit more about how synchronicity and yoga are part of that transformation yeah so when we think of 
union and mysticism as implying a sense of oneness. So it, it, implying that there's a holistic universe. And it stands to reason that within that, you know, there's this play in spiritual traditions of the subject and the object and playing with your perception, identifying or, or kind of peeling back the layers of the self to reveal that anything that can be an object is not who you truly are. Like you are that subject of awareness. So in terms of union and, and knowledge and synchronicity, it stands to reason that in a holistic universe, it's not in a traditional sense the knowledge is, let's just say, held in books in the written form. That it's just someone's someone's went through a process inwardly. They've written something in a book. You then read that. Your brain processes that information, and you you now understand holistically. With that again, going back to the um, the flower and the stem. I would suggest in terms of the union and the yoga of union through knowledge, the perceiver of that and the perceived almost on a different level combine. So there's a, a synthesis of knowledge that does require the traditional sense of reading or listening or however you describe it, but also has a different function in that holistic framework. And for me, the, the, the relevance of yoga as well is that these experiences are very exalted. Yeah. And, and I have had a lot of contradiction over the years, practicing meditation, really emphasizing a lack of content or just pure consciousness. I kind of judged my intellectual pursuit, but then for me that that process of research and revelation is, is a oneness experience. It's a, uh, a window into that holistic nature of, of the universe through knowledge. I think you're saying the process of reaching is part of the union. Mm -hmm. Beautifully put. It, 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 yeah. it's, it sounds contradict. Thank you. It, it, it sounds contradictory um, because it's the you got to get there, but the there is right now, and the there is the journey. It's not the journey. It's it's not the destination. It's the journey. Is something I heard a long time ago, and now you're clarifying what that is. That it's the it's the magical mystery tour that you go on, or, or Easter egg hunt, or some mystery thing where you're looking around for stuff and you know it's there but part of the mystery is the searching mm -hmm. tell us more about yeah. that that's so important i really like yeah that that description um and it is paradoxical and this has been a big question for me as well in terms of certain traditions looking at the self is, you know, in, in uh, Advaita Vedanta, this phrase, you are that. And I, I don't dispute that, but there's still a sense of relationship. And for me, with, with synchronicity in, in these experiences, that that relationship is engagement. I like you use the phrase, um, like Easter egg hunt. It can feel like that you're a detective trying to work things out in my mm -hmm. experience. And it is, for me, important because my conscious mind, uh, and I increasingly come to, to realize this, I, no matter where I'm at in my development, there's only so much that my conscious mind can access. And I have different degrees of being tuned to what I might call enchantment. And it's as if in that process, my conscious mind is reaching, whereas you know, the higher self, the unconscious, however you, you, you'd like to describe it, may already have access to that information. But I, in that, I'm reaching also to a higher power, even in the process of looking at knowledge. And something I want to note as well, why this is so important, is that 
it transcends various formats. So it does happen that, you know, reading a, a blog post there, listening to a podcast, reading another book, certain themes surface. But with the, the Headless Buddha, the wake, wake up call with that was the sense that it was also in this field uh, of what we call material reality as part of the um, the knowledge cycle. So the reaching and, and also that kind of metaphor for reaching for the Buddha and, and knocking that off as well um, feels really important. I, I do feel that, at least for me, there's always a sense of engagement and a sense of intrigue. Like there's a lot that's outside of, of what I can see. Uh, there's a lot of what's outside of what you can see, but uh, you reached for the book. Mm -hmm. You knocked the Buddha off the shelf. You participated in the headlessness of <laughs> that statue. Mm -hmm. You're laughing. Uh, how come you're laughing? I, I'll, I'll continue, but how come you're laughing there? I'm laughing because as you say that, what comes to mind is just the notion of free will. I'll, I'll leave it there for now and let you continue. But yeah, no, no, I, I, I can continue. But, but go ahead. With the notion of free will. I know what I'm. I'd like to say. So. It is, you know, it, it makes you if you accept a certain implication that all of that was relevant for this unfolding. As you describe, it means that the act of reaching the very that first domino that first act of reaching and knocking the ornament was somehow orchestrated to set up the rest of those dominoes which then leads a, a bigger question around free will and like if i feel like i'm autonomous and i'm instinctively reaching for something like that if you think about it <laughs> and i have I if you really so. think about the, the fine tuning of like how how precise that movement would have to be, a movement that felt entirely random, led to that being knocked off. I I've done that hundreds of times. I've reached for a book without doing that. So yeah, it does raise questions around free will. <laughs> and the question of free will you're asking is uh, is were you guided to do that? Was it somehow since it's such a low probability thing to have done? since you've reached up there before, um, were you guided? And no, and yes, uh, as usual with stuff like this. Yeah. <laughs> it's both, it's both of them. Mm -hmm. uh, there is what we call agency, which you're quite familiar with. <laughs> <laughs> There's agency here. You decided to reach for it and you can go through the whole sequence about how you decided to go for that book and you can do that um but i like to think when i think about this that it, that somehow you had um let's call it a precognitive capacity to recognize what you were about to do you had just you had written something earlier that was relevant to this that was uh, mm -hmm. in your on your blog uh, about what the headlessness i forget what you said it, it was but it was something like about headlessness and th then you create a headlessness so you were already primed perhaps in your own beingness and this is where we get into trouble is like mm -hmm. who am i and what is you i am you and you am and i am you you are me and i am you together <laughs> Poo poo to chew, says the walrus. It's like <laughs> it's been said a couple of different ways. But here we're talking about, I think, an important distinction. There is a Ricky Dur Duris here. Mm -hmm. And there is a greater something or other that you are immersed in and being influenced by. And it's not either or, it's that you're part of it. I mean, Alan Watts's flower is a nice thing, but you're not a flower. You're walking around mm -hmm. so that you have another dimension from what a flower has. You have the ability to go this way or that way. The flower has the 
there's the sun. I got to go for it. I hope there's some rain mm. coming around. Uh, and uh, that's there's there's a limited amount of let's say free will the flower has. You have more. You can make decisions. All this is a way of saying. I'm suggesting that some part of you was already looking for an answer to the question you pose in your podcast. And that somehow, and this is the, the tricky part of this, you were able to make a, a, what seems like a low probability move. It's not so low probability. You're reaching up there, the thing's hanging around on top of the shelf. You <laughs> could knock it off. I mean, it's not it's not like a hundred different things, options mm -hmm. you had. You had like, I'll say 10, that's probably fewer than that, in how you move to get that book. And pop, pop you hit the you hit the Buddha. The fun part of it is you knock the head off. I mean, that, that's but that's probably the most um the most fragile part of the statue. Because the the body, the head mm -hmm. are thicker. You're not gonna crack them as easily. You could. But you if it landed on this head, oh, you could crack or on the side of its head, you could crack it or a side of its body. So these the probability of the head coming off and you moving you moving up there and the head coming off is not as low as I think you are imagining it to be. It is low. And mm. part of what I do with synchronicity is try to be able to estimate probabilities of events. And it's, it's hard to do that, but it can kind of do it. So I'm, th I'm saying there is some sense of agency that Ricky had a question. Mm -hmm. Ricky had a question and he initiated a process that helped him find the answer. And the answer actually was in a book that he was reaching for, or at least the next one was. Uh, so there's, I'm going to, I'll end my part in this to say that there's more to your, let me say, free will intuitively i'll say not mm -hmm. consciously at all but there's so much we know without knowing that we know it and i'm impressed over and over again about how people do stuff and they don't know what they're doing yeah it just they don't know the impact they don't know the meaning of it and they just do it and then I, I see that at dance quite a bit mm -hmm. uh it's it, where a lot of activity takes place so uh, this is a long way of saying i think you had something to do it ricky <laughs> of course yeah I, i'm i'm not disputing that at all and, and you know there's something a big part of my background in, in terms of um you could say study but self-inquiry is very much informed by um Jungian philosophy and this idea of the self so the self being outside of the scope of the ego and the conscious mind the architect of dreams, the architect of, of these kind of experiences, including synchronicity. So there's there's that relationship for me, which is really important. And that is definitely part of um, the magic in it. Knowing that, you know, and to use Alan Watts, a metaphor that he uses that I really like, basically correlates the fact that we don't think of making our heart beat. We don't think of healing if we get a physical injury. And my understanding is that there are also psychic processes that are similar to that. They're more vast. We just aren't aware of them. In terms of probability, I, I would say, I, I agree, it's probably not that high in this instance, but it's almost as if the, these moments transcend at times that whole domain. And I say that because I think of you know, let's say a synchronicity where, or a serendipity where you meet someone and it's just completely relevant you were to meet that person. And if you were to trace back all the different decision points that led you to that moment, each decision, each micro movement, each choice just makes that, that probability exponentially um, less likely. So on one hand, I agree. And it's like with all of this stuff, on one hand, I agree. On another, I do think that there's what we might call, and in this framing that I'm talking to, I do believe that there's a space for divine intervention. That's one way of, of describing it. If we had no free will, no autonomy, 
there would be no divine intervention. It would just be divine orchestration all the time. And the the if you were to look at it in terms of probability, the divine intervention almost like just nudges the scales in any direction, in any moment. And I I do, I, I do believe that looking at, so we have intuition, the idea to read the book, but also instinct. And instinctively, the way we move our bodies, I do think can be informed by that higher self that we're not so conscious of. Even just as you, when you're walking down the street, oh, I'll go that way today, or I'll avoid going that way, or the, the different decisions, be it based in intuition, sense, however that may be, a part again of that relationship, at least in my understanding. Um, and I do mention that that is part of the essay as well, talking of free will and, and, and my view that I just, I also do not subscribe to that. We have no control at all. Like, I think the, the part of the fun is that there is a natural flourishing of, you know, the self of, of who we are, of what, what we're here to learn, but we're in engagement with that. And that's what makes it an exhilarating process, at least for me. Uh, I don't, I don't, I, I imagine if you, if you were to really take that to, to a logical extreme synchronicity, it wouldn't really exist in some sense because there'd be no engagement. It would just be, you're moving in that direction anyway. So it would just be a kind of um, movement without any friction or misdirection or guidance. Yeah, in order to have a synchronicity, I think you have to have a mind to perceive it. Yes. And if you if you have a mind that perceives it and you perceive it, then it's a recognition of your mind and an external reality on the one hand. And it's also a recognition that my mind is deeply connected to my external reality. Mm -hmm. So, so it's that paradox of separateness and integratedness or part of the flower kind of metaphor. But the separateness is really important, as you're saying. Um, it would just be all smooth and we would be somehow in a kind of heaven, which I think we can get to here, but it's important on earth. But it's, it's important to recognize that we can choose. And what do you think about this question about choice as you describe this? I was on the dance floor one time um, and somehow I got this idea, it might have been a voice that said, why don't you let us control your body? Just just forget about it. forget about you mm -hmm. deciding. You do it. Uh, let us do it. Uh, and don't buy and just let us come through. So <laughs> I, I was I was there. I was just kind of being kind of limp like a puppet on a string. And then my, my body was moving and, and this voice said, you think you're moving this? <laughs> <laughs> well, I had to say, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> it's How does that fit with some of what you're talking about? It fits well, and, and what comes to mind is similar with the the psychic or the emotional psychological relationship. There's also a sense of the potential to be animated and then to take conscious control of, of physical movement of the body. So almost like different energies and again it, it, these energies can be the self the, the the bigger self the higher self but the when we move or we get our conscious mind out of the way there is a, a flow to our being but i don't think it's so straightforward as that's all we have to do um i'm not sure if you're familiar with the millipede effect in psychology is that there's a, a parable or some kind of story of a millipede that was just walking down the road and then some other insect comes up to it and says oh you've got so many legs how do you walk <laughs> and as soon as that question is asked the millipede just stumbles and says, oh i don't know i don't know <laughs> because the millipede up to that point wasn't thinking about trying to walk and the moment it's, it thought about trying to walk it lost it, its ability to so 
I do think that there is a lot to be said for for flow state and like elite level um, sport, dancing, acting, writing, even like all these different creative outlets where some higher energy or some connected sense of flow moves through or animates your system in a way that feels quite distinct from a usual egoic I'm completely in control and I, I've had this of in terms of just purely being self-conscious and starting to feel really robotic in my movements I'm feeling anxious or you know paranoid or whatever and starting to notice that rigidity and it's almost like handing over to the you know the body's intelligence or however you want to describe that but it it does make sense to me yeah yeah, and I, I'm so glad you're talking about the millipede and <laughs> its legs and how how do you manage to walk and the millipede <laughs> stumbled. <laughs> uh, I played some football and I was running back a punt, and I was just weaving around and I got to the sidelines and I said, I just recognized that five guys had missed me, missed tackling mm -hmm. me. That's mm -hmm. when I got hit. When I no, became. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the millipede now is like embossed in my memory with that <laughs> hunt return uh, mm -hmm. because that's what happened. Yeah, exactly. And and that is it's hard to then know. Some people would argue there's there's a conventional skill or intuition in terms of you you go through the process of refining your skill, how good you are technically at football your ability to run if you're playing an instrument. But I do think that there is, there's more to it. And that thinking, like in your example as well, it can interfere with that instinctive flow of movement. Um, and there is a lot of mystery around that as well in terms of why that happens and how handing over that control and power is actually quite a liberating experience. And we come back to Ricky, there is reaching for the book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we're not going to answer that, but we have we kind of have talked about it. Was something coming through you And because you weren't paying much attention? We don't know, but it set you on a course of what I'll call, um, what I call seriality coincidences or serial coincidences where observable things have observable by other people it's not just your mind connecting and so you have to ask your mind you have to know your own mind to know there's a connection out there this is i could see the buddha the buddha's headlessness i could see the deepak chopra introduction mm -hmm. i could see the alan watts video all of which are available to me to see what you experience sequentially uh, and the idea that you've had experiences like that sequential form i'm not going to try to get into this now but i'm i'm looking at analyzing synchronicity stories mm -hmm. uh, and trying to see patterns in people's stories not just get one story but get a bunch of them and you've written a, a chapter for this book, The um, Playful Universe, mm -hmm. uh, as I have. And uh, the book is now out, just came out. Um, and we're, we're having this introduction, this book launch thing. Uh, it's, if you hear this, it's September 26th and 27th. Uh, you can find a way to get to it. So Ricky's... Ricky has written in that, and I did you have I haven't seen your chapter. Is, did you have this Buddha story in there? Yeah, yeah, that's the, where the Buddha story. Yeah, it's in there, and also a few other examples of a similar theme, of a similar with, with theme, sim a, an initial symbol, and then sequential unfolding. Yeah. Oh, wonderful! See, that to me says something about the way you process reality. Mm hmm. We each have these, uh, we call them filters, but they have a design on them. And it filters certain things. The reticular activating system in our brains is a beginning metaphor for that. It filters out mm -hmm. stuff that not relevant and then puts the relevant stuff to a higher part of our, our brains. 
but it's uh, it's also what happens analogically with our minds and this is what you do and as we're, we're coming near the end of our time together ricky and i'm really touched by your energy you have a you have really a, a heartfelt energy emanating from you and it comes through your talking but it's your heart resonating with what you're saying that mm. i i find delightful and engaging oh thank you it's a beautiful reflection i appreciate that uh well it makes it fun to talk to you i'll tell you that too so you're welcome uh it's have other people commented on how you affect them energetically <laughs> Uh, I feel a bit shy about sharing <laughs> around that. Um, uh, well, uh, yeah, don't do it. It, occasionally, don't. yeah, <laughs> I think the the thing is, you know, in and we talk of these experiences and synchronicity. I'm always the blind spot in my in any interaction. You know, so it's it's hard to to envision then yourself, but it, it does mean a lot. And um, yeah, to to me, and and I'm I'm happy you say that because part of that essay as well that I link it to is, is mental health and mental illness and how much meaning and reanimating and life that can come from these experiences. So I, I'm just happy that it does come across in these stories. And even though they can seem intellectual, there's actually just a sense of profound joy in there, <laughs> in the fact, not only we get to experience them, but that you have this podcast, you know, that we're talking about these subjects, that they're becoming more and more, we could say scientific, but just tangible in a way that, you know, and being articulated in certain ways. Cause I know a lot of people struggle to share these stories and they may be shut down. So I really also value the work that you're doing Thank in you. just bringing and giving voice to, to this. It's so important. Thank you. Uh, as we end, I'm going to um, bring up what you said earlier about reading a book and somehow as you read it, merging with the author. Uh, yeah, that's not what everybody thinks when they're writing something, for one thing. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> and and that's not what most people, that I, at least I know, are thinking when they're reading something. It's still the book's out there and I'm out here. But you are describing uh, creating what we could call a, a two-dimensional connection. That is, the book is three is two dimensional it's really not it's it's got dimensions in it already in the sense that the the words have vibrations in them mm -hmm. and their mm -hmm. their energy meanings thing in them so it's like uh, whatever you might call the fourth or fifth dimension is what you're asking and saying uh you can get from certain books like the alan watts book mm -hmm. uh, did for you but i have a feeling from the way you feel to me that you wrote that chapter in the playful universe with this in mind of connecting with your reader in the way you just described mm -hmm. the the original because I'd, I'd written one part of just the the buddha story and i was trying to be really clever with it and i was narrating the story and then tried to disappear as the narrator and discussed how how people relate to story and don't even question the narrator and then was like i'm going to disappear so that's a really astute observation um if it has any any kind of effect that you know that there's a a dose of that kind of enchanted um relationship with anything i create i'd be be honored and and kind of um yeah joyed with that but we'll see you have to let me know if and when you read <laughs> and when i read it uh yeah. it, it, i'll let you know um it's i think this is uh ricky there is way of relating to the world uh i think you are symbolizing by the way you feel to me and the way you talk about wanting the reader to connect with you and become kind of one together to create a oneness of between the between the two of you so that you go to a different dimension together of knowledge uh together uh, i think you 
not only probably intended to write that way, which it sounds like you have, but you also talk in that way. You also communicate in that way uh, that I feel. You, you're, mm. you're a living representation of being both separate and a connector to uh, some higher something or other consciousness, we can call it. That's that is such a beautiful reflection. Thank you. I, I do appreciate that. Um, yeah. yeah. Ah, how, even though you're your own blind spot, I like that too. <laughs> That's a good way. That's a good way. But we do get reflections back to us. So we get to mm -hmm. see each other in a mirror. There are mirrors all around us. And uh, some people like to think that uh, whatever the higher consciousness is, is trying to get to know itself through us. Mm. And uh, you are, if you're what you think, I think you are, you're trying to get to know yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, know, know thyself has been around for a long time, but at least in the Western culture, probably in, in China too. I can't just point to it. Uh, so you you get to know yourself by your reflections in other mm -hmm. people and how they mm -hmm. respond to you. So that's, I, 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 I'm reflecting back to you what you may already have a sense from about yourself. Mm -hmm. So you, yeah, maybe cover over a little blind spot with a little awareness, yeah. which I think you already have. No, thank you. I, like, I'm not often speechless, but I, I'm actually really moved by your ability to to pick up on that and reflect it in this conversation. Haven't you know we've not been speaking for long, um, and I do feel genuinely moved by that. I really do. So thank you. That is, that is a a gift that I'll also take away from this this conversation oh i'm so glad um because i've really enjoyed talking with you it's been mm. a as the beach boys would say good vibrations <laughs> uh, it's a, to laugh at it a little bit but also it's true um, this is a heart connection that you emanate wanting to be able to have with people who want to be able to do that with you mm. and you have done that with me and i'm, I'm I know you do that with other people. So it's a wonderful gift you've got. And thank you wow. for thank you for that with me. Oh, and, and same to you as as a host and interviewer. And and one thing I'd add to that is it's very much a dynamic. And certain people bring out these qualities. And and I've I felt in this conversation really safe to share, also to go to these domains. So it, it also speaks to you as a host. And where you are operating from as well, and and your heartfulness in in what you're doing. So it's it's a mutual that, feeling. I'm my, I'm my own blind spot. So, <laughs> <laughs> so likewise, I'm sure is an old <laughs> phrase. <laughs> Thank you very much for that too. I I I, I, I said, oh, I guess that's got to be true. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind of like that. Well, I'll I'll see you in uh, I'll see you in Berlin in um, a little more than a month. Um, and I look forward to meeting you in purpose, on purpose, in person. On purpose and, and in person. Yeah, I very much look forward to it too. <laughs> <laughs> this psychosphere is a mental atmosphere, like a hologram of cosmic consciousness.